Welcome back. This is your opportunity, your time to make comments, ask questions, make your points to the speakers. There are, as I've already said, you may not have heard, there are two roving mics. There's one on the upper echelon up here, and there's one down here in the stalls, so to speak. If you have a question, please raise your hand. Don't just start speaking. Not yet, sorry. Put your hands <laughs> down. I'm just explaining the rules of engagement, and then you can all raise your hands up. Um, and the guy uh, with the mic, there are two guys, one upstairs, one downstairs, will come to you, and he will keep hold of the mic. He will not give it to you, and he will point it in your direction. We don't want people running off with the mic or just going on and on and on and on. So we're going to keep control of the mic. Um, so that's my first point. Um, I do reserve the right to intervene if a comment or question is severely off topic. I will allow a certain latitude as the speakers have gone a bit off topic. But if you start speaking about gardening or the history of Alaska, I'm going to stop you dead in your tracks. Also, if you ramble on and on and on and on, I will also politely ask you to stop because that's not what we're about tonight. We've got a lot of people who want to make comments. Um, at the end of this, um, I'm hoping there will be a final two-minute summary uh, from each speaker. And at some point soon, um, there's a chap in the front row, Joel Titus. That's you, sir. <laughs> okay. Uh, from the English Defence League, uh, who uh, we have allowed to give uh, four or five minutes. Two minutes, he says. 120 seconds. One minute now. Okay. okay. <laughs> You're going to speak at all? No. Okay. We, 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 I will give you a, a, a time to speak freely. Uh, you're not up in the panel, but we've allowed you to speak that from the floor, so that, that's fine. I just want to get the questions going first, but at some point, uh, Joel, I, I'll, I'll ask you to speak uh, your time. So um, I, I'll try and be fair. Um, I, I do want some questions or comments from the sisters who have been affected by a lot of the comments tonight about the hijab and the niqab and so on. And I think it's important that women have a voice as they do in Islam and as they do in British society, to speak from their own experiences. So I do welcome comment from sisters, from women, who, uh, about this important subject. So you may now raise your hands if you have a question. Right. Um, that gentleman there who I spoke to seven minutes ago now has the opportunity to ask. Um, yes. I'd like to ask is that when Muslims originally came to this country, they were seeking sanctuary, many of them, as refugees from their own country. They left the sanctuary of their Islamic states. They brought with them Islam as a religion, which nobody has a problem with. Why then can they not accept? Why then can they not accept that we have one law in this country, which is a law that's passed by our, by our courts, via our parliament, via our legislation? Why do they then want to come and change what is set? They've come here for sanctuary under our law, under our principles. Why change that sanctuary? Right, I assume that's for Abdullah, that question. Yeah. <laughs> I, I foresee I'm going to be getting a lot of questions, it seems. But um, I would say this. In terms of, we're not here to change the laws of this country. We just want to live here in peace and, and be allowed to practice as we, uh, as we see fit according to our own choice. But what's the big thing about this? I can't even, actually, I think it's absurd. I mean, we're even having such a debate whereby the burqa is, is to be judged or whether it should be allowable or not. You know what? If they ban it, I want women to still go out the street with a burqa, and I want to see the police go up to them and rip it off their face. Not because I take pleasure in that, it's because of the, the I want everyone to see the level of what they so called uh, liberals of society, what it will become if it has to rip uh, clo the clothing off women in that, in that society. And I, I, I'm actually worried about this. But you said that we left our Islamic states. We didn't leave the Islamic states. We left oppressive secular states. Um, I, can I can name all the states in the, in, um, in the Middle East, and they are militantly oppressive. In Tunisia, for example, um, the hijab is virtually banned off the street, for example. Tunisia. In Turkey, obviously, we know the hijab is banned from, uh, uh, from all public institutions, like, uh, like France. These are meant to be uh, majority Muslim countries, yeah? Again, I can go with uh, <laughs> a, a few other countries. Their constitutions are predominantly uh, secular. And, and they only have a few cultural laws from Islam. They're not Islamic states. Uh, he's answering the question in his own terms. Uh, does sister at the back uh, in the black hijab, would you like to say something? Uh, wait, wait for the mic to come. If people could try and address their comments or questions to a particular speaker, I'd appreciate that. Um, there are quite a few comments, but I'll make them very short and, and, and precise. Um, just, I want to touch upon the niqab issue. I don't wear the niqab. 
And uh, when I interact with Muslims and non-Muslims, there are certain uh, laws in Islam which I have to follow. So whether a woman wears niqab or no niqab is the, is the same. Um, I, did, um, I, I trained as an English teacher in the summer. There was a lady there who trained with a niqab. So she was interacting with students, adults. So niqab has no problem with interaction. So that myth has to be abolished. This other issue about polygamy, again, I would um, invite Alan and non-Muslims to really study the Sharia and Islamic law, family law. It's very, very, very specific, very accurate. In polygamy, for example, very quickly, there are certain conditions and terms you just can't just go and marry four women just like that. There's certain terms and conditions. And there's a reason why a woman can't marry more than one man. For example, if she, if she has a child, how does she know whether, which, who's the father of, of that child? And again, divorce. The woman can go to the court and the qadi, the judge, he can give her the, 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 the divorce. Again, in Islam, we were given, 1400 years ago, we were given the rights to vote, we were given rights to uh, our own property, we were rights to trade, the Prophet, peace be upon him, he married a woman 15 years older than him, and she was uh, his employer. And uh, in Islam, if I work, my money is mine, my husband cannot touch it. So these are all about women. Now, the other thing I just want to quickly touch upon is Islam is an ideology, it's a way of life. It's, it's, Sharia is not going to come in this country or in the West just because pe people are so fearful. It's not going to come here. It's going to come, the Muslims are asking for it to be um, maybe uh, be implemented in their personal lives. For example, in marriage and what have you. Not as an, uh, a whole uh, governmental uh, sector. Um, so I don't think that that fear has to be eliminated by the non-Muslims. None of the Muslim countries, as Abdullah has said, implements Islam, the Sharia. They are all dictators. They're oppressive regimes. They torture their own people. So I would kindly invite non-Muslims, please, Talk to Muslim, talk to Muslim women and Muslim men and ask them questions. Don't be fearful and don't have this hatred and don't think that we're here to convert you. You know, in Islam, you know, we respect you. Go and look at the history, as Abdullah said. You know, in Palestine today, look at the situation and what we had. We had mosques, we had churches, we had synagogues, and Salahuddin Ayyubi, he made sure that nobody touched any of those mosque churches or uh, synagogues. Everybody was allowed to practice their religion to whatever they wanted okay. to. So Th those are things you. I wanted to Thank say. you very much, sister. Um, I've been handed a piece of paper. Uh, there's a chap called Abdul Hamid. I don't know if he's still here. There's a question he needs to rush off on the, in the upper gallery. Are you still there, brother? And if so, is there a mic? No? No. Okay, he must have gone, so at least I've... It's done my duty. Um, the, the sister, yes, with your hand up there at the top. Just wait for the mic to come. And if you could address your question or comment to a particular speaker, that would be helpful. Um, I actually have two speakers. I have Father Frank and Abdullah. Um, I was, it's a statement following a question. I wanted to um, ask Father Frank um, when he was saying so eloquently that liberal democracies do not work um, because of situations such as Iraq and Afghanistan. How did they work in, let's say, World War II and World War I when this country as a liberal democracy went and fought up for the, that, for the righteous, as it were? And point back to his first thing. Is your solution to securing the cracks between multi-faiths to ban abortion unless we'll just have more babies? That's what I wanted to ask. And you say you had a relationship that more wearing than the garb. You may have excellent powers of imagination, but the rest of us find that a bit difficult. And I'd like to also point out to Abdullah, while he was attacking Alan there for not picking either liberalism or his religion, I'm not sure if you've ever heard liberal theology, because Martin Luther King certainly did, and Archbishop Desmond Tutu, and when you are standing up for the rights of the Afghanistanians and the Iraqis, are you not yourself preaching liberal liberation theology powered by your religion in Islam? Okay, Father Frank. Um, the question about uh, the uh, First uh, World War, I, um, I certainly believe that uh, the First World War was a, a, a civil war amongst European peoples, which was precipitated for imperialistic reasons, a fight over markets and spheres of influence and colonies. And uh, uh, there was, uh, certainly in Germany, 
there was of a German parliament had to uh, uh, vote uh, to give money to the government for the war. So there was a certain degree of, of democracy already. But my general point is not that uh, uh, liberal democracy is intrinsically wrong. All I'm saying is liberal democracy is not a panacea. It is not, the, uh, as some people have claimed, that it was actually almost uh, the uh, culmination of history, the end of history. The liberal, once a liberal democracy triumphs, all conflicts are abolished, there is only one way of life. The struggle continues, and liberal democracy has proved itself quite flawed, quite faulty from that point of view, given examples I gave. The other example is, um, you asked me about abortion. Um, first of all, I made the point of abortion uh, I mentioned abortion because the argument had been by, uh, by the Dutch MP was that uh, Muslims have uh, too many children and so European peoples are not uh, having enough children. I say, well, if you want, uh, you, uh, I was following, addressing myself to, to, to uh, this chap, to chap's argument. But I believe the reason why abortion is wrong is, is because it is murder. It is a crime. It is a taking of life. And that's a position which I stand upon. It is based on the Christian <coughs> tradition. And even the Archbishop of Canterbury, when an uh, out and out liberal, when he was elected, said the sheer fact that women refrain, for example, from say, doing certain things, smoking and so on during pregnancy, erasing, please recognize it, that the fetus has rights. The fetus is not just an appendage. OK. OK, Abdullah, um, would you like to respond? Yeah, uh, the, uh, the lady asked if I had heard of um, Martin Luther and reform theology. And uh, I could say, yes, I have. But have you heard of what Martin Luther said regarding the German peasants who, wanted to, who disagreed with their government and were massacred by the German government? He agreed with it. He said that because in the Bible, Romans 13, that the, the people should be under the rule, they should obey the ruler. And they, because they, they, the ruler is the wrath of God, by the way, in Romans 13. So Martin Luther said, anyone who rebels against the ruler deserves to be massacred. And so he supported that. I advise you to go and research that. John Calvin also reformed theologian. Uh, Abdullah, it was Martin, Martin Luther oh, King, Martin Luther not King. Uh, Sorry. But they're 20th both reformed. century civil rights campaigner, yeah. not the they're, well, German they're both reformists, Reformation I guess. theologian. They're both reformists, but um, all right, uh, all right. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. You mean Rewind. a more contemporary reformist? Yeah. All right. Um, Martin Luther King. Yes. You know, uh, he's uh, he's a liberal Christian. Um, I think that the type of Christianity that, that Alan Craig represents uh, after debating with him is not uh, the same kind of liberal Christian. And certainly, a lot of factions which are behind him or or in in, in uh, or his colleagues are not are the fundamentalist Christians. They're not liberal Christians like Martin Luther, but the case is this, the Bible says what it says. I'm not, I'm not condemning it or condoning it, I'm just merely saying the Bible says what it says. When it talks about the, the, the women verse I quoted, it said that women should learn in science submission, a man is over a woman and so on. All right, right. So, what, well, sorry? The Quran, doesn't, the, the Quran doesn't say that, the Quran doesn't say that a man is superior to a woman. Not a single verse, not a single verse. Right. Not a single well, first. Uh, Abdullah, we're now going to move, move on. Uh, um, I respect your, what you're saying, but, but I'm now going to move on because that's not the topic. That's fine. Uh, we could all be like that. Um, the, right. I, I've invited um, uh, uh, Joel Titus from the Indian News Defence League, as arranged, to uh, make a short statement or speech. So you have the floor, sir. You can stand up if you want. Or just so we can hear you. Uh, the mic's coming. The mic's coming towards you. So, uh... cheers. Can I take it? Yeah, for, right. Literally, from I think it was about July, we li we literally started this movement. From we got we started this movement against Islamic extremists. We got told that we would be gone by the by literally the close season of the football. We would be gone because we were hooligans. We're still here today. Now we've grown from 40 supporters to 10,000 supporters. We had 2,000 supporters, Muslim, Hindu, Sikhs, Jewish, women, all the, uh, the elderly from last Saturday. Literally what I'm saying now is a statement is that we're still here and we're not the, we're not the persona that we've been put down as skinhead, racists, white supremacists and all stuff like this. 
We're multicultural. We want to stand together against Islamic extremists. And that's that, basically. Sir, the, the gentleman there, yes, you're, you're looking at me. You can stand up. Wait for the mic to come to you and ask your question or make your comment. Thank you. Is it him? Is it him? No, no, it, uh, it's, it's him. Yes, the guy with the hand up. Sorry, it's difficult to... Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. You know, um, the problem I'm getting from this here audience is there's too much of a cultural, um, how should I put it, dogma, and that people are more concerned about this is what I like, this is what I desire. Now, let me quote to you a verse from the Quran which states that there are certain things that you may love that is bad for you. And there are certain things that you might not like that are good for you. God knows and you know not. So I'm not trying to come across as a religious theologist. What I'm saying is we need to look more into solutions as opposed to what we culturally love, what we culturally desire. Today we have in this world economic meltdown. In this world we have um, a world where there's no social cohesion, where there's intolerance, where there's wars, where there's starvation. We have so many problems and issues. Now, me, sometimes I don't like getting up for work in the morning. You know, that's my desires. But it's good for me to go out there and to work. Sometimes I don't like, you know, revising for some of the exams I have training for. But, you know, that's just something I have to do. Um, so what are the solutions to the problems? I mean, religion today is not applied anywhere in this world, whether it be Britain, whether it be France, whether it be in, in, in Israel, whether it be India. So, so, so to, uh, the, point, the point is... I'm going to draw that to the, a close the, now, the, the, sir. The, the Thank point. you for your comment. Um, do any of the panel want to respond to that very briefly? Because there are other people who want to speak. Okay. The gentleman there with the suit. Yes, you, sir. Just, just, it's not his suit. Okay, I apologise. <laughs> Uh, hi there. Uh, it's more of an observation, really, than a, uh, a question. But, but I was thinking about uh, what, what the father said about Britishness. And I, I've c come to the conclusion, listening to the debate, that there are probably three key aspects of Englishness or Britishness. Uh, the first one is that we are an eccentric bunch and we love eccentrics. And good heavens, we've got a very, very British panel here today. Um, my, my, my second thought was that, that one of the other great things about Britishness is that we invented Anglicanism for the purpose of preventing people from boring on about God. And uh, it is one of the great things in Britain that, that it is generally considered to be bad manners, to be a little bit too fervent about your faith and a little bit too difficult about it in public. And I think that is a very, very strong and valuable British characteristic. The, the third thing uh, about Britishness, and this perhaps comes on to the question uh, or, or, or the key issue, uh, we hate sectarianism. We like to feel that we're all in it together. We like to feel as if there are not things dividing us and preventing us from standing together as human beings and as a nation. And it, it is, I think, a great shame that um, we are now living in a period where religious politics is becoming, if not so much acceptable, certainly more commonplace. I mean, Alan, for example, is a liberal Christian, but I think it's a great shame that his liberalism is expressed in terms of Christianity, which is, you know, it excludes people who are not Christian, but who do agree with many of the things he says. I think it's also a great shame that, that uh, there is only one Muslim speaker on this platform, and that only Muslim speaker is, uh, as far as I can tell, ideologically quite closely aligned with, his, with the uh, Islamist group Hizbut Tahir. Because, uh, you know, there are many Muslims in this auditorium who simply don't share your view yes. of Islam and don't share your view of Islamic well, politics. And it would have been nice to have seen a little bit more diversity on the panel, yeah. uh, including Muslims who are liberals, secularists, and from other religious and political traditions. Uh, um, <laughs> no, no. Thank you for that very intelligent remark. I, I, I'm also a Muslim, although I'm not uh, giving my views. But nevertheless, there are two Muslims on this platform, uh, although only one of them is a speaker. Um, the lady in the glass at the back has been waiting very patiently. Would you like to just wait a second while the mic comes to you? And then I'd like to go upstairs, uh, if there are any, yes, to your sisters afterwards, please. 
I, I'd also like some questions for the speakers specifically to answer. Yeah, um, some challenging points would be nice. Thank Thanks. you. It feels quite nice. We'll just talk about brothers and sisters, and I feel like I'm in a union meeting. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, just one quick comment and then a question. Um, just to say that all religions, um, not religious people specifically, but all religions are misogynistic, they're oppressive of women, all of them are, uh, and it's very much about how people interpret those and play them out in their lives, whatever. Um, the question is, I mean, it is, and unfortunately I didn't mean to ask a question to Abdullah, um, but it is specifically to Abdullah, but anybody else in the panel, because he wasn't the only one, who was using language like, Muslims and English people, Muslims and Westerners, Muslims and Muslims and liberals. Why? I mean, I thought it was a real shame, as if the things were mutually exclusive and so divisive and so wrong, fundamentally wrong. And I think to look at things like that and, and to feel like that, and if he genuinely feels uh, that, that one cannot be a Muslim or one and English and a Muslim and European or whatever and Western. That's not only a great shame, but it's, but it's um, something that he really needs to, you know, deal with. And it's a really, it's a really divisive uh, way to look at the world, and and it's unnecessary, and it causes those divisions between people which just shouldn't be there. And I hope that most people don't think like that. Actually, most people are very comfortable with their multiple identities, and of course, it's important for people to be religious or not religious, but also equally to be English or European or Western or part of the world. Um, and whatever. So I just want to ask a question to, to Abdullah, but also because he wasn't the only one. Um, I know exactly what the BMP will have to say about so I'm not directing the question at them. Um, uh, you know, why, why this division? Why this divisive language? Okay, that's a very good question, okay. Abdullah. Yeah, well, um, I think you, you're, you're putting an interpretation into my mouth of what I meant. I didn't say that I'm not uh, a Duke. I'm not li living in the West. I'm not from European extraction. Of course, I'm from European extraction. Of course, I live in the West. Of course, I've got a British passport and so on, like, like uh, most people here. And uh, you know, I'm not saying I'm not uh, making a, a, a division. What I am talking about, I talk about it in. Uh, I talk about it, and this is you're, maybe you're right. I talk about it in terms of how they look at me, how 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 others look at Muslims. That we are some alien. We're foreign. There is a division between you know civilizations and so on. And it, there were at one point, the Muslim, you know, the Muslim world was the West, you know, Al Andalus, you know, we were the West, so to speak. So I'm not making a division, and I don't see us as being, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, as being different. Where you're from in the world is, is irrelevant. Really, it's how you define yourself in terms of your character, your, your principles, uh, your, the, the, if you're ethical or not. That is the true identity of any human being. We didn't have a choice where we were born, we didn't have a choice which country we, come, we grew up in, or what passport was put in our hand. What we do have a choice is the kind of person we are, and that's basically what I'm discussing about today. Muslims, uh, we've chosen to, uh, I've chosen to become Muslim, I've chosen to, be, to adopt that identity, and that's part of who I am, and so I'm discussing that in that capacity. Okay, thank you. Anna wants to make a few comments. Yes, I wonder if I could, because there was a lady in the hijab who specifically asked questions, one relating to education, the second to Sharia, to me, I think, and I haven't had an opportunity to do so. But I'd also like to pick up with a lady there who said all, all religion made this extraordinary sweeping generalization, all religions oppress women. Um, to, coming on to the, the, the lady, with, she made two points. Firstly, the question, I think she, if I heard her right, it was quite difficult to hear. She was saying that she'd been to a school where there was a woman wearing a niqab and she was teaching perfectly adequately. Um, that may indeed be, but I'm grateful for the fact that actually, and I know this because it was related to the, to the Tablighi Jamat sect, which is trying to promote this mega mosque, there was a, 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 a teacher, a Muslim teacher in a Church of England school up in Dewsbury, who uh, three or four years ago started, suddenly started wearing a, 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 a niqab. And there was a huge debate about the whole situation. Thankfully, the authorities decided that she couldn't continue to do so. They reckoned it was impossible for her to communicate with normal children when she's hiding herself behind a niqab. And I think that's really important. I think as a society, we can say that. If you want to teach in our society, if you want to teach in schools, then you've got to be able, the children have got to be able to see your face. Your face is you in many ways. It's the relationship. But can I come on to this thing about Sharia? And I acknowledge that Muslims are as varied as the Christian community. And that's why the latest sweeping generalization about all religions oppress women is such nonsense. Um, there is huge variety in the Muslim community, and what we have to do is try and get back to the basics. And one of my arguments against Sharia, it goes right back to the basics of it. I'm just going to very rapidly, because it was asked for this, I want to read from the Quran, okay? Surah al-Baqarah, chapter, if you like, it's uh, chapter 2, 
verse 282. Yes, I've got that right. Sorry. And get two witnesses out of your own men, and if there are not two men, then a man and two women. If you get two men, or if not a man, then a man and two women, such as you choose for witnesses, so that if one of them errs, the other can remind her. That is actually fundamental. So I acknowledge there are Muslims, there are very modern, progressive Muslims here in London who don't go for this sort of thing. But the fundamentals of Islam, the fundamentals of Sharia law, is inequality for women. And if I was a woman here, I wouldn't want it at all. And, I, and actually, as a man, I don't want it for them either. Perhaps I better leave it there. I'd love to come back to the lady who said that all, all, all religions oppress women. It's such nonsense, but perhaps there isn't time. And it's actually, uh, it's off topic as well. Uh, that's not what we're here to discuss tonight. Frank, did you want to say something briefly? Uh, uh, Just very briefly, because I really want to bring in the audience. Point about the, uh, how tricky it is to take any religious text as to quote it just straight off, because all religions have an apparatus, the technical word is hermeneutics, I know what Paul likes this word, because we have mentioned him, uh, which means the interpretation. Any text has to be interpreted. And of course, uh, fundamentalism is uh, takes the literalist interpretation of a text, and that is the tragedy of fundamentalism, but it misses the point that any religion, any faith, any church which has a sophisticated approach to its revelation would know how to deal with a text. So there is always a danger in just quoting a text straight off. Even Abdallah, the famous text is taken from the first letter of Paul to Timothy. There are various ways of interpreting a passage, so we must actually go a bit deeper and not just stay on the surface. No, I, 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 sorry, Abdullah, I really want to bring in the audience. Now, the guy with the, the green top, who I understand is a nationalist, hang on a second, first, and then the lady who's been very patient, the niqab, you've still got your hand up, sister, I see you, you'll be after the guy with the green top, and then the guy at the very, very back, yes, who's standing up, you will be the third, and then, over here, um, I know Jay Smith, so I'm going to be prejudiced in favor of someone I know, and then it would be Jay Smith, who I know is a very vocal, uh, articulate man for his position as well. So the man in green, the lady in the, in the niqab, the gentleman at the back, and then Jay, and then hopefully we'll be able to continue after that. So the gentleman in green, please. Hello there, thank you. Well, I, I'd like to address this question to Andrew Copson, who's quick to call other people extremists. Now, I would say that the British people are very angry at this moment in time because they're denied a lot of freedoms. And a lot of British people actually feel that they're living under a very, very oppressive regime where their views are not allowed to be aired. And I commend the MDI for this debate th this evening. And this is why we have, you know, people like the English Defence Leave because they feel that they have no representation. Now, it would seem to many people that there is a trick being perpetrated on the British people, which is the Lib Lab contract, as we call it. And as part of that contract, they've brought in this bogeyman, which is called Islamification. And they're hiding behind it the wars that they're waging and they're creating divisions amongst people. They are stirring up anger. So I would say, the extremists are actually in government at this moment in time. And there's people like Andrew Copson making a very, very good wage out of this industry which they have created. Now, what are the three main parties going to do about this? The Islamification of the UK, the British National Party, you will not find, is banging on about it all of the time. We realise who are the enemies of the British people, and that is the Lib Lab country, and they are mainly white liberals, not Muslims. Okay, thank you, sir. don't uh, deny that that very strong feeling is out there and that it causes tensions. If you remember, one of the things I said was that we had to take some of the articles, for example, that were read by uh, the panellists and the BNP seriously and that the scoffing in the audience wouldn't do from that point of view. So I think you've entirely mischaracterised 
and what my position is if you're saying that I don't think these tensions should be taken seriously. I do, and I think they should be discussed and discussed openly. And what I was saying, the third part of uh, the reason why I recommended uh, this shared liberal and secular framework for discussing it was precisely so that we had some sort of forum in which those could be discussed. Because at the moment, if one goes, rushes to other identities instead and fails to find the shared ground where we can discuss those tensions, some of them legitimate and some of them not, um, then we are failing. So I think you've mischaracterised me and I'm not very well paid. An important point about not being paid well. Um, the sister of the niqab, please. Over to you. And good evening to everybody else. I understand I'm the only woman here wearing a niqab, so I only think it's um, important, or maybe not, <laughs> um, for me to actually speak on everyone's behalf. Um, in terms of freedom and choice, I understand this is all here in the word of freedom, and I don't want to repeat what Abdullah said, but there is a huge contradictory um, for the statements of oppression. If I, have, if I am told to take off my niqab, I am being oppressed. And that is, that is it. And to kill stereotypes, I am not married. I do not have a father, any brothers, any sons. It's as simple as that. So to just kill the stereotype there, this is my choice. And this is my choice of act of worship that I am doing to submit myself to my Lord. And I think a lot of Christians will be able to relate to that, and obviously other people of faith. So please do not oppress me and ask me to take off my, my so-called barrier, okay? We have classrooms with people of niqab teaching, and we have classrooms with people of niqab without niqab teaching, saying you've experienced hostility, and others have affiliated... Ho oh, sorry, I'm nervous. <laughs> others have experienced... Submission. So where, is, where does the barrier lie? I'm a film student, and there's an expression in film that everybody watches a different film. So hostility and a barrier to you is peace and submission and beauty to somebody else. So where does the standards lie? Why should I take your opinion of a barrier and not take somebody else's? As for the people who act as if we are oppressed by men or Islam oppresses women, please, and I ask this, I am, it's a pledge, please do ask Muslim women, ask me. I am, I am more than welcome to take questions and to take, ask me about my faith. Do not take the opinions of non-Muslims who clearly does not understand the faith. I just think that's ignorance and I will not undermine the intelligence of non-religious people and I will not un undermine the intelligence of the West and undermine the intelligence of the British people that there is religion out there and it cannot be the, the blame of all this hostility and all these problems because there is problems with or without religion. We have wars in the name of religion and we have wars that are not done in the name of religion. So clearly the problem is not in religion and clearly the problem is with mankind and maybe we can look in as the brother behind me said in the solutions rather than highlighting furthermore the problems if we are in a debate let's communicate inshallah uh, the gentleman in the beard who's been who's standing at the back has been very patient over to you Alan, is that Alan, the guy on the left to you? Uh, Alan Craig, yeah, yes. Yeah, it's my question is to yourself. Uh, hello, can you not see me? <laughs> uh, yeah. My question is to yourself. Uh, basically, the question is, you've so nicely put it how, you know, you've got people from other cultures and religions living by, beside you, your kids play together. I've got two questions to yourself. You related the fact that smoking was banned, but I'm not sure if you understood why it was banned, because it was harming other people's uh, uh, health, because you can't smoke in public, you can smoke in your own private sector. How does the niqab hurt somebody else? Apart from the statement that it makes that you suggested, how does it hurt someone? And the second thing is, I want to understand your understanding of the niqab, because you obviously said fitra and you didn't understand what it meant. So what does the niqab mean from an Islamic terminology? Those are the two questions. Yeah, I think it's what you already answered it, but if you want to briefly reiterate. Uh, sure. Um, 
Firstly, I'd like to say that I think it's fair to say that the NICAB is not. If we follow the leader, I'm not sure, quite, quite sure of his title, but Al-Azhar University in, in Cairo, he recently came out and said quite clearly that the NICAB is not Islamic clothing. Maybe that's up to debate within the Islamic community. Uh, I don't know. I, I, in what way does it oppress or in what way does it hurt? It is quite simple. It is anti-social. That is what it is. It is anti-social. The lady spoke very eloquently over there, but I can't relate to her because I can't see her. I wanted to see your face. Relationships are the most important thing in society, and good relationships are what it's about. Right, um, Alan, we're going to leave. Alan is, is repeating himself, but that's because you, in a sense, uh, invited him to repeat himself. He's always said it several times. Jay Smith, please. I will just wait till the microphone gets to you. Oh, yeah, OK. Uh, it's good to be able to talk. I think the, the subject tonight was Sharia law, and we're looking back and seeing whether or not it no, is it was relevant. It the of Britain, myth or reality. That's myth the or topic reality. of tonight. It's not, it's not Sharia let's, law. Okay, well, Sharia, is it myth or reality? Let's go back and, and let's ask. One of the problems that I think we're having, and I think those of us who live in England and the West have, with the whole concept of Sharia, is that it's the religion that dictates many of these laws. And I've come from a tradition, a uh, religious tradition, Christian tradition, uh, where Christ was asked that very question in Matthew 22, verse 21, where he was asked who we should give allegiance to, Caesar or to God. And he said very clearly, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, give to God what belongs to God. And there became the, the whole impetus of the separation of church and state. And for the first 300 years, this was the case. There was a separation of church and state. The church was not a part of the state. Uh, unfortunately, Constantine came and stopped all that. I'd like to ask both Abdullah and uh, Alan, since they're the ones who are representing, I think, best the two religions that are, that are uh, in opposition here tonight. What are you going to do with the fact that Sharia law seems to take away that, uh, that which belonged to the state? It seems to take on a, a whole different entity which was not entailed for, which was not made for. And is that not the fear that we have here in Britain? The state must dictate secular law. We have no problem with that. We don't have a difficulty as Christians. As Christians, we have laws unto ourselves, and yes, we regulate ourselves by those laws. But those laws are only for Christians. They're not for those outside of Christianity. The fear we're having, and the reason why this is even brought up today, is that Islam seems to impose its laws, its structures, and its categories on the state and also on the wider culture, as we have seen in many examples with Muslim countries. I'd like to hear what Alan says, I'd like to hear what Abdullah says. Is this the, re uh, is this the responsibility of the uh, religion, any religion, whether it's Islam or Christianity, or should this be relegated to the state, the secular state in the case that we have here in Britain? Okay, thanks Jay. Alan? Sure, you, you've, uh, as no doubt you know, you've put your finger on the, one of the real distinctive differences between Christianity and Islam. Um, the difference between Jesus and Muhammad was Muhammad became a military leader, a governor of Medina, and also a prayer leader and an Islamic prophet. He had many roles. Jesus didn't have any of those roles. And out of that flows the nature of the religions. Jesus said, the kingdom of God is within you. Therefore, the kingdom of God is invisible. The Christianity is not territorial. It does not have states. And I would be absolutely against having a Christian theocracy, a Christian state. That doesn't mean I don't want Christian values infusing and impinging on society. Of course I do, because I think Christian values are universal values. Okay? So when Jesus says, love your neighbors yourself, we all ought to do that. Whether you're a Christian or not, you don't have to go to church to learn that. It's a good value which we all, which we all believe in, and so on. I believe the sanctity of life would be. I'm sure I disagree fundamentally with Andrew. I'm longing to get to grips with Andrew over here, but it's not the subject of tonight. But the whole thing about the sanctity of life and the whole thing about euthanasia and abortion, which I see they're promoting uh, on their website, I would, th these are universal Christian values, which actually Muslims and atheists and people of goodwill can buy into, but not a Christian state. And when, when Christianity has had a Christian state, it has gone, because it has done, it has gone wrong. That is not what Jesus asked for. And, it, and, and when it's happened, it has gone wrong. It has been a bad advertisement for its Christianity. Uh, Islam, on the other hand, needs, ultimately, need to have an Islamic state. It is a territorial, political religion. It cannot not be, because Muhammad was. And those are the fundamental differences between the two. Thanks, Alan. <laughs> Firstly, just a, a quick clarification. There was this poll done by University of Maryland 
and they asked uh, Muslims from around the world, Morocco, Egypt, uh, Pakistan, Indonesia, do you believe in Sharia? Do you want to have a, do you live under a caliphate in, in that country and unite the Muslim world? 75% said yes. So I don't think I represent a minority, my friend. I I'm actually um, an Orthodox Muslim, like every other Muslim here. I don't think any other Muslim here uh, uh, who believes in this orthodoxy would, would disagree in, in, the same, in the same sense. But I want to respond to his point. Yes, Islam does believe it has a political program for um, implementation of morals. But you see, the funny thing is, Jay Smith is a Mennonite Christian. It's a small faction of Christianity that left Europe. It was persecuted by other factions of Christians. Uh, because they believed that the, the state was evil, or uh, Christians basically shouldn't get involved in politics, full stop. He disagrees with Alan Craig. I don't, if Alan Craig says that uh, uh, Jesus wasn't interested in politics, what the hell are you doing as a, as a London co councillor? Christian People's Alliance Party? Shouldn't you just be called the People's Alliance Party? Why Christian? Why you put it? Is, that is hip hypocritical on your, on your, your side. Either... The, either <laughs> And, and lastly, I'm going to argue, uh, and I, I don't want to take away Frank's shine here, because I want, I want him to come on this. He's, he's from a more orthodox perspective, obviously. But I, uh, I did a debate where I was, I was debating with an American evangelical about does uh, Christianity believe in war. And I didn't come in as a Muslim. I said, today I'm going to be an orthodox Christian. I studied orthodox Christian literature. And if you read the works of Augustine, Martin Luther, John Calvin, not Martin Luther King, by the way, and uh, uh, Thomas Aquinas, yeah, all of them believed in, uh, Christians can get themselves involved in politics, can implement uh, laws of apostasy with the death penalty carried with it. To, uh, they believed that uh, uh, you, know, you can uh, even uh, have wars to spread Christianity. And the, the justification was from Proverbs where it says, he who spares the stick hates his son, he who, he who uses the stick loves his son, the law of love. Therefore, thereby, a society must be rectified by the stick because you love that society. And that was the basis for Christian politics for a thousand, uh, a thousand and so years. But I will pass it to Frank, who will explain better than me what Christian before you do, Before you do, uh, Frank, and I, I welcome your contribution. Um, after you've spoken, I'm going to go right up to the top to one of the, uh, the sisters after Frank has spoken. And then we're going to come down here, and I'm going to invite some people who've been very patient for the last half an hour, and I'm not invited at all to ask anything. So, Frank, then upstairs, and then we'll be down here again. Uh, very briefly, I do not buy the naive, literalistic interpretation of the famous passage, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. It was a dialectical answer to a question which was meant to trick Christ. I don't believe of a Messiah, of a Son of God incarnate, want to divide the world into two parts, one part belonging to the state, one part belonging to God, very self-contradictory and absurd. But even if that was the case, which is not borne out by Christian tradition, because Christian tradition has always maintained, in fact, that the church, mainline Christian tradition, the church has an important role to play in public life. Even if that was the case, we should not give to Caesar what is God's. We should not give to Caesar what is God's. There are areas of life which have ethical and religious uh, consequences which uh, religious people have a legitimate uh, claim to intervene into. Uh, one example would be the area of a just war, uh, where there are norms and principles whereby in the name of Christianity, in the name of theology, you can actually judge whether it's right or wrong to take part in a war. So I do not accept that kind of uh, literalistic and naive interpretation of a famous passage. <laughs> Thank you very much, Frank. Um, one of the little sisters at the back, I'm not sure which one, yeah. Um, my name is Asha and my question is to Alan. Um, it's a very, um, very, very brief question. Um, in your um, speech you, you um, stated that um, wearing a burqa or a piece of cloth on your face hinders social cohesion. But how do you explain the failure of um, multiculturalism and when the government has uh, poured a lot of funding into that and still multiculturalism in Britain has failed, that's why some people do not identify themselves as British or um, English or whatever other nationalities they have in this country? I was going to ask him anyway. Um, did you, okay, the, the gentleman in the green top. After that, the gentleman with the moustache and the lady in the front room who's been trying to catch my eye for the last hour. So apologies, you afterwards. So, guy in the green, moustache, and the lady in the front. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, 
I got here fairly early, so I went and had a cup of tea down in the Old Witch, and I was walking back up the King's Way when somebody gave me this. And so I said, oh, I'm going to that. But I, I took a copy anyway to read when I got here. It says, Islamification of Britain, reality or myth, a panel debate. What we're not having is a debate. The one thing that's not happening here is a debate. We've got various people who purport to be Christians. I, I think we are having a debate. Uh, uh, I don't see I'm coming to the question now. We've got We're various... having one now between you and us. So this, this is a debate. Okay. Uh, what I'd like Geoffrey to explain is uh, our basic traditions in this country uh, and how they've been developed over the years and how they exclude certain things that are not helpful. Could you say something, John, about that now? I, I know you have your point of view on that. Could you, could you say something? Yes, please. Well, we have 1,500 years of tradition, as long as other people here claim they have traditions of English law. It's been built in a sort of unwritten way. It's done by debate and it's done by precedent. And the precedent can be argued. And precedent tends to develop law to suit the society that it's in. So we have that tradition. We have a tradition of openness and fairness. And what we're actually saying is that the face thing, it has nothing to do with religion. It's not a religious. We live in a Christian society. That's Christian with a small c. It, we, most of us don't go to church, but we have this Christian tradition. We don't quote texts to each other because we know from past experience that this sort of religious um, dogma stuff doesn't work. We've had two civil wars in this country, the Wars of the Roses, which was a sort of pretty disastrous thing, and then the second one, which was mentioned, which was Cromwell, and that was a, a religious setup for a number of years, okay. which completely failed. Did Jeffrey, do you and want it to doesn't work. say yes, anything? I, well. I, think, I think the people who wear niqab, I think the burqa and the niqab is basically the same kind of thing, isn't it? It covers the face. They don't know how much it really sort of just annoys us. And um, <laughs> it, is really is, it really is infuriating that you come here and do something which we find absolutely unacceptable. Okay, uh, we're now going to move on from that. Uh, it's, it's a political statement. It's got nothing to do with your religion. In the Quran, it doesn't say, you know, go around with your faith covered. It just doesn't say that. Right. So it's a political statement. It's a, it's, a, it's a gesture of opposition to our culture, our country, our whatever. Okay, Jeffrey. The gentleman with the moustache and the lady right at the front. Yes, sir. Uh, I need to, sorry, can a mic get to him? <laughs> All right, well, look, put it this way. The big question, if we talk about whether it's a myth or reality, we've had um, a program, Undercover Mosque. I'm not endorsing it, I'm just saying it was there. And there's a fear, uh, there's a suspicion of Islam. There's fear, there's hatred. I'm not endorsing either fear or hatred, but just recognise the reality of suspicion. And when we talk about Islamification, the suspicion people have and the fear that they have, which leads to the hatred that some have, um, is partly because they see Muslims Taking money from um, taking money from a pre the kind of oppressive regimes you condemn that would oppress you. I'm thinking specifically about Saudi Arabia, where there is no religious liberty. Where if you convert from a, to, from Islam to another religion, you'll be executed. Where there are no churches, no synagogues, no Hindu temples, or Pakistan, where you can be put, uh, put in, sentenced to death for the blasphemy law. They see British Muslims taking funds from these oppressive regimes. Take, for example, in Birmingham a few years ago, they took money from the Iraqi regime, and we had the big Saddam Hussein Mosque. They changed the name now, but it's that kind of fear that they, they invite Saudi scholars to come over here, Saudi government leaders, and from a dictatorial, oppressive uh, country with no religious liberty. And the other thing is that they don't hear British Muslims condemning these things. They do hear them. I accept you're completely right. The British Muslims have condemned Al-Qaeda till they're blue in the face, and it's made no difference to Islamophobes. But they haven't heard the same volume of condemnation of Saudi Arabia, of Pakistan for the blasphemy law. These are the kind of things we need to hear. These are what people fear about Islamification. And so long as British Muslims do not speak up about this very loudly, then those people will say those fears are justified. And they will vote for groups that, work, that do highlight this issue, and they will listen to people in the media who do highlight this issue.
Um, um, I'm going to take the liberty of stepping out of role for a second. I'm not going to be the moderator in the chair for the next uh, minute or two. I'm just going to be me, Paul Williams, Muslim. I'd like to respond to that. Um, I'm proud to be British. I'm also very proud to be Muslim. God comes first. Uh, Thomas More famously said to uh, King Henry VIII, Thomas More was the most loyal servant of the king, but God came first. And that is my attitude. I'm loyal to the British state. I love England. It's my country. But God comes first. And that's actually a Christian, a Christian attitude is, uh, as well. Excuse me, I'm speaking. <laughs> um, about that um, infamous documentary which took place, uh, filmed mainly at Regent's Park Mosque, a place that I often frequent, um, it completely distorts and misrepresents what goes on there. M most of the Muslims there are very moderate, kindly people. Yes, there are some uh, extremists, and I condemn extremism, but it distorted what really goes on there, and it fuels fear and hatred. I used to fear Islam. I used to, I, I didn't go into my local shop because I thought it was an Al-Qaeda outfit. It's not. It's actually run by Shias, I now know, and they're lovely people. So there is this climate of fear that's being whipped up by the media, whipped up by ignorance of what Islam is really like. I invite you to come to Regent's Park Mosque to meet Muslims, to meet me, and find out about what Islam is really about, not the Saudi Wahhabi version, which, frankly, I don't warm to either, but there's other forms of Islam, the British Islam, there's a Sufi Islam, there's traditional Islam, like the Christianity, let me give you one statistic. Uh, a recent uh, survey was done in the United States of Christians in America. 10% of Christians, evangelicals in America, want to be ruled by the Bible alone, and they want to bring laws back that would execute adulterers and homosexuals. Yeah? The, 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 these are the equivalent, the Taliban in the evangelical world, if you like. I do not hear evangelicals disassociating themselves from these people, and I, I, I would not want to live in a, a Christian theocracy either. Anyway, my hat goes back on now. I said that I didn't endorse them to come and watch. I said it was out there. But it whips up fear and hatred. It whips up fear and hatred. Okay, I'm, I'm now going to draw my own contribution to a close. Thank you for tolerating that. I'm now the moderator again. Right, um, <laughs> I, I, I think Bilal thinks that uh, as the only Muslim, I'm getting bashed a bit too much, so he'll come to my rescue. Thanks. Um, but you know, I saw a program called, called Jesus Camp. And that scared the hell out of me. But you know, I had, I had knowledge enough of Christianity to know that that was only a very small faction of Christians. That wasn't representative of all Christians. Yeah, uh, most Christians are Catholic, they are Anglican, and they're not uh, uh, this militant evangelism. And, and not all evangelicals are bad, by the way. I'm not insulting or attack, attacking all evangelicals. But they were, they were a, a, a faction of the Ameri American Christians. And, I, and that is the problem, you see. We take, we take a small group, let's say Al-Mahajroon, every, every um, issue that someone brings to me, oh, what, what do you think those people that brought those placards outside the mosque saying, be, you know, behead those who saw the Prophet? Or what do you think of those who did the, the Luton protests? It's all one group. It's only them. Just, just them. The large majority of Muslims don't follow that. And even that, even more than that, in Luton, the, the Muslims got so tired of Al-Mahajroon, always hogging the headlight, uh, uh, headlights and so on, uh, well, um, they actually went out, 300 of them went out, and they went and approached the Al-Mahadroon stall, and they basically uh, uh, pushed them off the street and sent them packing. In Luton, did you, did you know about this? No. Why not? Because you didn't look at the media. You didn't, you didn't actually really research properly. You see, we only see a narrowed, um, uh, uh, skewed perspective that we think that the extreme on one side must represent the whole side, and then you act in an extreme way, and then the other side sees you acting like that, and then, and then the vicious circle continues. My, my message today is that as Muslims, we are human beings like yourself. Yes, we have disagreements in political philosophy and, and whatnot, but we still have the same motivations. Um, our, our, our women want to have the freedom to go and wear what they want to wear and not be told, dictated by you guys, who claim to be for women's, women's liberation, to, tell, to dictate to them what they can and can't wear. This is the biggest hypocrisy, and I think it's an injustice uh, uh, to the women. And, 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 to, and the last point you mentioned, you said, um, was it about the state? You said in uh, the Muslim world, yeah? Okay, I want, uh, why don't you just say something to what I actually asked? Sure. Ask you about British Muslims, say, in France, when the because of the image it presents to the British people, because of this occupation, that if you had the chance, you would impose. This is in fear. I'm not saying it's rejected, it's valid, but it's the fear of suspicion that 
that by inviting these people in, that this is the kind of society you want to impose on Britain. So what I ask you is that will you make a statement now to say to British Muslims, do not accept any more money from the Saudis, do not invite Saudis girls for as long as they're engaged in religious repression. That's my question. Okay. I'll give you one minute, then I'll end. Yeah, okay. T time is pressing. We've, we've gone past the uh, quarter past nine deadline. Um, some of our speakers have to leave uh, very shortly. I will allow Abdullah one minute to respond. And I apologize to other people who have not had an opportunity this evening of asking questions. Then we're going to have uh, a brief two, one or two minutes summing up from each speaker in the order that they spoke originally this evening. And then that will conclude the evening. So Abdullah, you have 60 seconds and then we're going to move to a summary from each speaker. Sure. Um, firstly, I'd say that, um, again, who is anyone to restrict the comings and goings of intellectuals into whichever states and so on it, it, it might be and whichever they come from? Maybe they come from Saudi Arabia and maybe they actually have something good to say. You know, may, I, I, just, I have disagreements with a lot of the scholars uh, uh, um, from uh, certain sects which inhabit, which are funded by uh, the, uh, certain Muslim governments. In the Muslim world, and I think everyone that knows me knows of my condemnation of this. In fact, I would argue that I, I, would, I would wish the uh, uh, governments in the Muslim world stop funding scholars because our scholars are trapped by the governments. The governments control our scholars. Our scholars can't give their opinion freely, and they are dictated to by the government. And this is, this is a, a big problem in Islam. In Islam, we believe that scholars are separate from state, but the state is rules under the, the, um, uh, uh, the, uh, an Islamic law which again is uh, meant to free the people to actually show that no one owns Islam, the state doesn't own Islam, the people own Islam, and they can basically uh, be ruled over by Islam. So that's my, that is my condemnation against them. And in terms of England, in terms of being in England and receiving money from, uh, from certain states in, in the Muslim world, well then, uh, what, let's tell America and Britain to stop funding Muslim organizations that suit their purposes in the, in the Muslim world then. Let's have it go both, both ways then. Okay. Thanks, Abdullah. Right, I'd like to invite uh, Geoffrey Marshall from the British National Party to uh, perhaps sum up in a minute or two. Well, I suppose whilst accepting that um, Islamification is a relative term, it's possibly the problem isn't so great as some pretend. Um, nevertheless, I think we have a core culture in this value, uh, sorry, a core culture in this country which people who come to this country, who choose to come here, should respect. And um, uh, issues like the, um, the niqab and, and the minarets, the, these are things we should be allowed to determine in our own country. This country fundamentally belongs to the people who built it, the, the indigenous people. That, that, that's, that's my view. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, Abdullah, you have one or two minutes starting. You've heard a lot of uh, viewpoints today, and no doubt certain, uh, my colleagues will say things after this which I can't respond to. I wish I could. But I think to, to sum up is this. I want you to look into Islamic history. There was a time when Muslims uh, didn't have a state and they were oppressed, and some went to a place called Abyssinia. And in Abyssinia, they met the Christian king who was a just king. The Prophet Muhammad said that he was a just king. And he said, you can stay here in peace. And the Muslims stayed there in peace. They didn't, uh, want to, they didn't start to... Uh, uh, put placards out saying behead those who do this or do what have you. They lived there in peace uh, and so much was the, the justice of Abyssinia that the Abyssinia, um, uh, unlike the other governments around it which were uh, dictators and despots, which obviously the, 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 the Muslim armies faced these dictators and despots, and, uh, no one touched Abyssinia because it was a just land and it's, it's about example, leading from, from example, justice. So Abyssinia, because it was a just land, the Muslims lived peacefully, they didn't bother the Christians, Christians didn't bother Muslims, they lived together, and that is our example today. As Muslims, this is our example. This is our Abyssinia. And, and just like that time, we were told that in this country there is justice. So we came to this country, well, obviously I'm from Europe, but anyway, uh, we came to this country, a lot of us, and because we thought that there is justice in this country. But when we got here, what were we treated? Because of some international uh, issues that the politicians stoked up, now everyone starts hating each other. People start nodding their head like me, even before I start speaking. Oh, it's the Muslim, he's going to say something. Oh, he's all, it's all rubbish. You see, is that the human way to treat people? How can we ever come to understanding when the first thing that you're going to respond to, to, to a, a Muslim or anyone else is nodding your head and saying, oh, forget it. I, he's got nothing important to say. I have my opinions. I'm going to do whatever the hell I want to, the, to these people. And I don't care what they have to say. So the, 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 my advice and my last message is, 
We want to live in peace. We don't want to establish Sharia in this country. We want to establish Sharia in our own country. We want to deal with our own backyard. That's what we want to deal with. Just like the Prophet Muhammad and the Muslims did at, at, at that time. This is our Abyssinia. And if, you, and if this can be a just place, then I think that we, all of us can get along and live side by side in the spirit of harmony and mutual cohabitation. Thank you. Alan Craig. Uh, I guess I'm not allowed to. I'd love to ask the gentleman down the corner, what on earth is a Christian with a small c? A Christian to me seems to be a follower of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who died for him on his sins. If that isn't relevant to the man, how dare he call himself a Christian, it seems to me. However, this is about his lamification, and I would love to see you afterwards, sir. I'd love to see you afterwards, so you can learn about what real Christianity is about. Um, so don't go away, please. I'll be here. Uh, but actually what I want to do is say, I, there has been quite a lot of talk about fear and stirring up hatred and all this sort of thing. Muslims are human beings. Abdullah, he does talk nonsense from time to time, but he's a good guy, okay? Paul has chaired it recently. Well, I didn't agree with him actually stepping down from the chair and having participating in the debate, but he's a Muslim. He's an Englishman, but he's a Muslim. He's a good guy as a person. He's a human being. Relationships is what it's all. Love your neighbor as yourself, said Jesus Christ, and that is what it's all about. I'm really sorry that the lady over there is wearing a niqab, and I can't be in relationship with her. But everybody else here, I think I can be in relationship with. And that seems to me to be the essence of it. Nobody else, nobody, nobody else here has put up a sign, don't come near me. This is what it, and I think if anybody here is in fear of Islam, if anybody here is, or anybody watching on those, on, on the, is in fear of Islam, do not be in fear of Islam, do not be in fear of Muslims. Engage with them. They're human beings. And actually by engaging and having these debates, you will see what is right about what they say and what is wrong about what they say. There's a great deal about what is wrong about what they say, but at least let's engage with them and give them mutual respect. That's what I've got to say. Thank you, Alan. Father Frank. Um, Islamification of Britain, reality or myth. I think largely a myth, but let's face it, it's quite clear that whether they admit it or not, many people don't really like Muslims. Now, what would I want to say to that? I would want to tell them um, a mini parable. It's a parable about a man who had a garden which was infested, let's use that word, by ladybirds. You know, we all know what ladybirds are, lovely little things, but if you've got lots, you know, it's a bit of a problem. Well, the man became, tried to get rid of his ladybirds, uh, tried uh, various insecticides, tried various methods, nothing worked. He got really worked up about it. So he wrote to the Ministry of Agriculture, even, and he got various replies, but no way, it didn't work. And the ladybirds kept being around, there were lots of them. And there was a, a neighbor across the fence who um, um, had a nice smile. And uh, so the man asked the neighbor, what can I do? What can I do with all these ladybirds? You know, they keep being here. I can't get rid of them. I'm getting crazy. And his neighbor uh, smiled. He looked at him and he said, I suggest you learn to love them. <laughs> Thank you, Frank. <laughs> Andrew. I wanted to respond uh, earlier to the uh, gentleman who wasn't wearing the suit um, because he was talking about Britishness and um, what that meant. But of course, Britishness is really about the state. It's not about a culture. The culture is English, and he mentioned Anglicanism. What he meant was the Church of England. Um, and one other gentleman over there mentioned about um, 1,500 years of our development. That was of England developing and English law. Um, so far as we're concerned um, with the question that a gentleman raised over there about the Saudis, um, what we would say is that there ought to be a level playing field. And for as long as the Saudis are not allowing churches to be built in Saudi Arabia, they shouldn't be allowed to be funding mosques to be built in England. That, that would be the point that I would make in response, though. Um, <laughs> what we need to do 
is to focus on acting in a way which encourages integration and making our society work. And what we say as English Democrats is that that has uh, got to be the way forward and the way we need to make sure that our society uh, feels and people in it feel that they have a role and a sense of belonging to England. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. And last but not least, Andrew Copson. Thanks. Um, I'll be very brief. I did notice with the questioner at the back uh, that Abdullah did make many references at many points to we and you, and I regret it because I think if there's one point that I was trying to get across with what I said, I do strongly believe that what unites us uh, in our humanity is much greater than actually what uh, divides us in terms of religions and, and non-religious beliefs. And uh, in the end, it has been rather difficult to be speaking, I think, from my perspective. Um, as I said at the beginning, it upsets both sides of uh, the argument to some extent, and um, I accept that that has occurred. Um, I think it is wrong to focus on Muslims or Islamic immigration in a nationalistic narrative, and I think it's nonetheless important to address the real tensions that exist and to uh, debate them and to resolve them. And my main conviction, really, is that when we're undergoing that process and when we're trying to achieve the resolution of these tensions, um, that we should be guided by certain principles. And I would recommend uh, the principles of a free and democratic and secular state as the framework to resolve these issues, because I think that has the potential to move us away from divisive narratives of whatever sort and into the sort of place where we can resolve uh, these questions as part of the same uh, society and the same state. Thank you. Well, thank you to all our speakers, to Jeffrey, Abdullah, Alan, Frank, Robin and Andrew for an excellent debate. Thank you all very much for having the courage to come here and thank you for asking your questions and bearing with us over this three hour period. Just to remind you, our website, the MDI website, www.thedebateinitiative.com. Thank you and good night.